he turned up the dirt on people like the LVF and the UDA and their drug dealing activities, and that's probably the group that killed him. Well, I consider it a, 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 every bit as significant as, the, uh, as significant as the murder of um, Veronica Gearn here in 1996, and the murder of any journalist anywhere in the world. Uh, it was an attack on, on the freedom of speech. They chose a, a soft target. They gunned him down, shot him in the back, shielding his wife. Heroes of Ulster, loyalists, loyal to what? When reporting on a divided society, more often than not, the truth itself becomes a casualty. Each side embraces its own version of events, its own perception of the truth. Martin O'Hagan, like so many other journalists, knew the risks of offending one side or the other. Tonight, Insight reports from Lurgan on the murder of journalist Martin O'Hagan, who paid the ultimate price for living with his enemies. Mid Ulster is no stranger to paramilitary death squads. During Northern Ireland's long and bloody conflict, gunmen roamed the streets and townlands around Lurgan, Portadown and Armagh. So efficient were they that the area became known as the Murder Triangle. Martin O'Hagan lived through those murderous times. He reported from streets of fear on the terrorist killers, focusing on the UVF murder gangs and their leaders Robin the Jackal Jackson and the young Billy Wright. According to his editor at the time, the seeds of Martin's destruction had been sown. I think, in fact, they were more the reason for his murder than anything he'd been working on recently. I think it was an accumulation of grudges that various different loyalist factions had against him, going right back to the time of the jackal, Robin Jackson, which was the first investigative story that Marty and I worked on together. Martin O'Hagan matched his schoolboyish enthusiasm for the job with tremendous courage when it came to his speciality, confronting wrongdoers on their doorsteps with unpredictable consequences. You knew what it was like to take a dig in a gob, if that's what you're talking about, you know. There wasn't much of him, but when somebody took a swing at him, he could duck as low as the pavement itself, as the doorstep itself, and it was usually the boy standing behind him who got the dig in the gob. But uh, aye, he'd go and confront people, and um, that's part of the job as well. You bang up there, you're in their face, and you get a punch in the face, but that's what we do. It's what tabloid journalism's about. From the moment he first wrote about Billy Wright, Martin O'Hagan created a dangerous, sinister thread of mistrust that would outlive him. Journalists have a penchant for making up animal names for loyalist paramilitaries. But the only time they'll make an animal name up about a Republican is to praise him. You know, like the border fox, which indicates sly and cunning and ability and carefulness. Whereas we get dogs and rats and all of that stuff. And I think that, you know, we all need to look at this a wee bit more logically. Tell the truth. But uh, you're not there to hurt. You're there to tell the truth. And I think that many people have uh, perhaps uh, um, got hung up or hooked up on uh, the sexy stuff that comes out uh, on a Sunday especially a Sunday. The unwelcome nicknames were designed to sidestep the laws of libel. At the time, Billy Wright's gang of young terrorists was referred to as the Rat Pack, hence Martin O'Hagan's nickname, King Rat, for its leader. The paper's coverage of sectarian killer gangs almost cost Northern editor Jim Campbell his life when he was hit by five UVF bullets at his North Belfast home. Well, that was back in 84, many years ago now, and that followed the uh, expose that Marty and I had been working on about Robin Jackson, the man we had nicknamed the Jackal, and uh, he took grave exception to st the stuff that we were publishing about him, and um, he contacted the, the, the Shankle Butcher gang in Belfast, and two of them carried out the attack when I was shot at my home. The threats continued. But Martin O'Hagan continued his work with diligence and good humour. In 1987, as he tried to get into McGilligan Prison to report on a protest inside, a UTV reporter mistook him for a loyalist supporter. Oh, I'm up from the Sunday World. What? I'm up from the Sunday World to talk to this man. <laughs> After a UVF bomb attack in the Sunday World office, Martin O'Hagan was forced to live in the Republic for his own safety, returning just before the 1994 ceasefires. By the time Billy Wright was publicly defending his stand against a combined loyalist military command threat, 
he had already decided to break away from the UVF and set up the Loyalist Volunteer Force. Wright took his vendetta against Martin O'Hagan with him. In an interview for this programme in March 1996, Wright insisted he wanted peace, but not at any price. The desire of the Loyalist community is to find a settlement. They earnestly want peace, but that should not be seen as a weakness. Uh, Ulster men are quite prepared to fight and die if the democratic wishes of the people are not upheld and if the IRA continue to kill their civilians. They are duty bound by oath. Four months after giving this interview, Billy Wright's renegade UVF men shot Catholic taxi driver Michael McGoldrick twice in the back of the head. Wright's message to the UVF was clear. The Mid-Ulster members did not respect the ceasefire. It was against this background that Martin O'Hagan continued to probe the true purpose of the LVF, even after the INLA murdered Billy Wright in the Mays prison in December 1997. The LVF is geographically centred in and around where Martin lives, ported down Craig Avenue, and uh, the, um, it's, I mean, everyone knows, I mean, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a very sectarian terrorist organisation that is heavily linked with, into the UDA, and uh, Martin wrote about that. And he, um, I mean, he was he was geographically positioned uh, to know what they were doing. He could see it in his own town, his own community. So he was able to expose what what they were up to. And uh, as I say they're they're a very violent group. In death, Wright had become a loyalist icon, and whatever political direction the LVF had went to the grave with him. The organisation concerned wasn't aware that it was breaking a very, very important taboo that you don't attack members of the media. Uh, I suspect that in the case of the IRA, they've very often been very annoyed by what journalists have said about them, uh, but they haven't made them targets because they, the, the IRA is somewhat more sophisticated in its understanding of political life, and they realise that to kill a journalist would be to go beyond a certain go beyond certain bounds and that would get you know, the whole Republican movement into political difficulties. The LVF without that political sophistication uh, simply weighed in. Martin O'Hagan died the kind of death he reported all too often in the past. The victim of cowards who didn't have the courage to own up to their deed. They claimed the murder in the name of the Red Hand Defenders, a flag of convenience frequently used in the past by the LVF and other dissident loyalists most notably when they wanted to murder what be seen as maintaining their ceasefires. But forensic tests exposed the LVF's lies. The gun used to kill Martin O'Hagan had been used in April this year to murder Graham Marks in Tandragee. Insight has learned that this weapon is under the control of two brothers from Antrim. We understand one of them passed the weapon to a Dungannon member of the LVF who transported it to Lurgan. Last year, the Dungannon man survived an attempt on his life in North Belfast. Martin O'Hagan's death was widely mourned. Interned in the early 70s as a member of the official IRA, he later served a three-year jail term for possessing guns. Released from prison, he renounced violence and became a journalist. Marty's desk's over there. I don't know how we're going to fill it or when we're going to fill it. But um, we'll fill that desk and there'll still be somebody sitting over there doing the same work as Marty O'Hagan did, same investigative probing journalism. But not everyone mourned for Martin O'Hagan. On the Monday following his murder, LVF leader Mark Swinger Fulton, seen here with Billy Wright, telephoned to UTV to deny he had anything to do with it. Fulton referred to the brutal murder of Martin O'Hagan, but he did not express regret at his killing and he declined an interview. Fulton contacted a Belfast newsroom from prison in January last year after the murder of Richard Jemison to deny LVF involvement. The murder marked the beginning of a bloody LVF-UVF feud that has claimed four lives in County Armagh. The question is, what is it about? Is it about people who are prepared to allow the exploration for peace and some who are not? The man seen here with Johnny Adair at Drum Cree last year is Gary Fulton, Mark's cousin. After a failed UVF attempt on his life last December, he took a two-week holiday in the Caribbean before moving into a fortified bungalow on the outskirts of Portadown. This man, Robin Andrew King, known as Billy, is the LVF leader in Lurgan. 
a long-time associate of Billy Wright, he was jailed for 16 years in 1994 for conspiracy to commit murder. Well, uh, when serving his sentence, he was charged and later acquitted of the murder of David Keyes on the LVF wing of the Maze Prison. Better look now what we're going to do about Martin O'Hagan. If nothing's done about this and the pressure isn't kept on the institutions, then uh, they're going to do it again. They'll do it again up there. Paul Williams is the crime correspondent of the Sunday World in Dublin, someone who has lived with threats against his life for many years. These cowboys conned their way out of prison, didn't they? Only this week he was told by Gardaí that he's being targeted by the real IRA. This is the thing. The government here and the government in Britain are talking about taking on terrorism, but like it is a bit of a joke when you see the likes of Martin O'Hagan being murdered, because they are turning the blind eye. There was one murder here, for example, uh, last year, a gangland murder, which was organi organised by the OC of the IRA in Dublin. When it came to arresting that man, the police on the ground here in Dublin were told, leave him alone, we don't want to arrest him yet, because he was part of this great peace process. You know, what price is the, do we pay for the peace process? Five years ago, Veronica Geeran was murdered as she sat in her car at traffic lights in a Dublin suburb. She was killed because of her exposés on the activities of a criminal gang led by drug dealer John Gilligan. The reaction to the murder of Veronica was huge and uh, the, the country practically came to a standstill. All the radio programmes were taken up with it. Um, the president was at the funeral. All and I think Tony O'Reilly himself made an appearance for the funeral when I don't think any of the O'Reillys who own the, the Sunday World made an appearance at um, Martin O'Hagan's funeral. Who represented the paper at the funeral? The paper was represented at the funeral by, um, by um, uh, our director, uh, Morris Hayes. It was on... Uh, it there was actually nobody from the staff here? No there was nobody from... The there was nobody from uh, I, and uh, I regret that I couldn't go that day. I would like to have been there, and uh, it would be normal that one would. But uh, on the particular day, I think we were kind of a bit surprised that the funeral was on Monday morning. We thought perhaps it would be on Tuesday, and we didn't, unfortunately, organise to get there. It's the first time it's ever happened in 30 years in Northern Ireland. This funeral takes place. There's colleagues from the Sunday World can go there. But there's nobody from Sister Paper, the Sunday Independent, or the Independent. No journalist. But that's the reason, unfortunately. Uh, we weren't there. Well, is it not it's, very poor it's, excuse. It's not an excuse. I'm just telling you the reason why we weren't there. Some journalists, like Susan McKay, believe newspapers in the Republic failed in their reporting of Martin O'Hagan's murder. There is a view down here um, among uh, the editors of papers that um, the North doesn't sell papers, but I must admit that for myself I, I would have thought that uh, something like the murder of a journalist, the first journalist to have been killed in the Troubles in the North in the full 30 years or whatever, uh, that it would have merited much more substantial front page coverage. There was anger on September the 28th when the Northern Ireland Secretary announced that he had reversed the decision to declare the UDA ceasefire over, following sustained rioting in North Belfast, during which loyalist gunmen fired on police and soldiers. While I am deeply sceptical of any wants emanating from this organisation, even at this 11th hour, I am prepared to put the UDA to the test. There will be no warnings, no ultimatums, no further statements. This is a wake-up call for anyone who thinks they can drag Northern Ireland back into the chaos, the violence and the sectarian hatred of the past. A few hours after Dr Reid's announcement, Martin O'Hagan was gunned down in Lurgan. At the time, behind-the-scenes talks were taking place to save the peace process. John Reid, I, I believe, is a decent man, but why he stepped back, why he stepped back from, uh, you know, declaring the UDA ceasefire void two Fridays ago, uh, at the last minute, the public should know why he took that decision. The government feared a move against the UDA at this crucial time could lead to a backlash of violence. Sinn Féin arrived at Downing Street on Tuesday, October the 9th, and hopes were raised of a breakthrough on decommissioning. The following night there was serious and sustained rioting on the Shankill Road and next day the Secretary of State made his move to declare the UDA ceasefire over. The inclusion of the LVF seemed like an afterthought. Chief Constable, 
has given me information clearly showing that the UDA have continued to plan and engage in acts of violence against individuals, families and police officers. They have systematically breached the ceasefire and I believe that the patience of the people of Northern Ireland has run out. I have therefore decided today to specify the UDA and the UFF. I have become increasingly concerned about the state of the LVF ceasefire. The briefings which I have received have convinced me that the level and nature of their violence has also reached the stage where they can no longer truthfully be said, even in the round, to be on ceasefire. The policy, if there is one, is to ignore the obvious, is to ignore the fact that terrorism is still rife in this community. And Martin was writing about that, and Martin was writing about the, uh, the transition from terrorism or paramilitarism into the drugs trade and that's a very important area and it's had major consequences for this community and if, if the death of someone like Martin is let go then we're, we're none of us going to benefit at all. I know that Martin was the first person to be killed but a lot of, of journalists have been threatened by loyalists and a lot of journalists have felt very unsafe going about their work in very hardline loyalist areas because loyalists um, have a bad attitude towards the media. They, they have an aggressive attitude. They believe that the media re misrepresents them, that, that we are all um, Republicans in disguise, that we never show them properly. And there's such a savage irony to the fact that these people murdered Martin O'Hagan because they can't bear when scrutiny is actually turned upon them. They don't like what they see. And their answer to that, obviously, is, is kill the messenger. Martin O'Hagan's killers are still at large in Lurgan, but the LVF, in what some regard as a cynical attempt to make political capital, were quick to use the IRA's act of decommissioning. Pointing out that it led the way in decommissioning weapons three years ago, it declared its belief that all future conflicts should be confined to the political arena, ignoring its last brutal act of murder. For family and colleagues of Martin O'Hagan, there are only memories of the 51-year-old journalist who lived for his family, but died for his job. My lasting and uh, abiding memory of him, uh, I suppose, would be the last story he was working on. And he came through the door, and he would pull you out of the hallway, and he said, got a great story, got a great story, got a great story. Unfortunately, there's only the first line of the first paragraph of that great story that's left on his computer over in the corner. and. Uh, that's my last in memory. I've got a great story, my doll. Great story. Martin O'Hagan never got to finish his last story. Instead, he became the story. <laughs>